Statistics, dates, and iconic images tell one story about a country, but to catch the subtleties and the spirit of a country, individual experience can capture what the big picture often misses. American writer Richard Rodriguez first encountered America as a little boy, speaking only Spanish in his native California. Today, he is one of America's finest essayists. His most recent collection of essays is Darling, a Spiritual Autobiography. And he joins us now on what his experience can tell us about the U.S. state of mind. Great to have you here. Thank you very in much. In the province of Ontario. Your life, if we can use the lingo of today, went a little bit viral when you published in the early 80s your book, Hunger of Memory, and in it you revealed that you turned down Yale, which is not a thing that most people would do, I well, guess. Well, Yale was romancing me, as a number of other schools were, uh, because they thought I was a Mexican. They thought I was a minority. They thought I was disadvantaged. And they wanted somebody like that to teach English Renaissance literature. And the absurdity of it all, I, I, I had long ceased to be, in my mind, a minority in a cultural sense. Mm -hmm. I, I already as a teenager, I thought of myself as an American, no longer separated by language. Despite the fact you spoke culture. no English till age six. Well, but I had the, 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 the huge change in my life was that I was influenced by Ireland. I was educated by Irish Catholic nuns who did not fool around. The Irish can, can, can convince you maybe on March 17th that they're all sentimental and sweet with Danny Boy, but these are <laughs> tough creatures. And, and those Irish women had come across the ocean, had, uh, had traveled across the country to shove the English language down my throat, which mm. they did. It took about a year and a half. Mm. And one day I raised my hand and I had the conviction that English, this language that I'm using, is my language. And from that change already began this education of Richard Rodriguez to no longer feeling himself separate. Um, what happened to my life is that I was very lucky, but I entered a realm of irony where I was rewarded by the time I was in college with being a minority. And by that people meant that I was literally a, a numerical minority. Mm -hmm. The higher up I went precisely because I was not a cultural minority. In other words, that as, I, as I ascended the educational ladder, I, I, I found myself in a more and more rarefied world so that I was numerically a minority precisely because I was not separate from that world. I was not a cultural minority. And we should so, just remind everybody, you, you had, what, four universities you went to? You're a Fulbright scholar, went to, I, I mean, I went eventually to, ended up in England. You've, you've gone to all over the world. I, I was overeducated. <laughs> you were overeducated, okay. I should have done, like Barack Obama's daughter, I should have taken a year off somewhere <laughs> and done something else. I should have skinned a few uh, uh, wild animals, but done something. But uh, no, I was a scholarship boy in the English sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when the offer came to me, as it did at the end of my education, to be a minority at a place like Yale, um, I, I couldn't play the game anymore. I didn't want that mm. game. And I wrote my first book largely as a protest against the liberal ideology that it created the notion that I was a minority. Uh, very good reasons. I mean, there are minorities in this culture. A number of them, I should say, are white working class people who don't even count anymore in the description of minorities. Mm -hmm. And if you think their grievance against America, against the liberal agenda is not red hot, think again. But I, um, I was of the appropriate color, of this of visage which people thought of Hispanic, mm -hmm. although this is an Indian face. I don't know what Canada would make of this, but um, whenever I come to, to Canada, I always get assigned at the airport to this, let's take a second look at this young man. <laughs> <laughs> and I would always end up in this room with grandfathers from Yemen. And, uh, because I was considered, this place is also considered dangerous in the world. Uh, I could be Arab, I could be, who knows what he is, Persian. Hmm. So um, in America in the 1970s, I was a minority, and people read it as a Hispanic face. Well, you're now in a country that's officially bilingual, and given your background, people might suspect that you would be open to America embracing bilingualism, but you're not there. How I'm come? not there. I, well, I, I see the pedagogy the pedago the, the, uh, the, the, that's, that's governing the education of, of poor children to be largely middle class. I think that the, the, the problem or the necessity for educating poor children is to teach children how to speak public language. Not forget English or, or French or Spanish. We're talking about the difference between public and private language. Many children cannot understand that they have a necessity and the right to use language publicly. 
by which I mean to talk to a stranger, to, to, to pitch your voice when you're in fifth grade, high enough so all the boys and girls can understand you. You understand public language. A lot of kids in, in this country, in, in America, have no notion that they're related to a public society. And so it's Meaning not, what, they only speak their own particular they, uh, they, jargon? They do, or they belong to gangs where, where my, you know, my, my tribe understands what I'm saying, or we make up our own language, or we live in a kind of gibberish of, 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 of a third language and so forth that's neither home or public, but a kind of uh, stasis between both, both places. I really still feel the necessity for Richard Rodriguez moving in the Spanish sense, where there are two pronouns that govern uh, language, the two, the intimate you, mm -hmm. the whispered you, and usted, the public you, the, the, the you that goes on television in Mexico City. That usted is, 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 is formed in the, in the consciousness of working class children in the classroom. It is not formed at the, in their homes. We well, have the same thing here. You have two in view. I'll, that's right, I'll say. that's right. And that, but, but, you, but I, think, I think there is this sense that, oh, it's better for you to speak two languages, three languages, four languages. Mm -hmm. You're better off for it. Well, all I'm telling you, Canadians, if you think you're bilingual, is how hard it is for many working class children to speak one language in two ways. So before so, we worry about a second, third, and fourth language, let's get, pub let's get public language that's first. Right, that's right. You want to okay. go to Appalachia and yeah. hear the way yeah. poor huh. whites speak English? And, and, and the, the difficulty of them understanding that they can speak television language like you do, that th that voice that you have is not their voice. They, they, it doesn't announce them. And so um, that difficulty is still among liberals of the middle class in America. Their distinction from the working class is still so deep that they're proposing, you know, using the language of the street in the classroom. For example, Ubonics, this language of, of black America on the street, using that as a classroom language or as in the, the, the advertisement of the of bilingual education when I was younger, the bringing the family language into the classroom. Hmm. When I heard that, I realized that they don't know what they're talking about. Family language is by definition, not public language. So when you hear people you say the word ax, when they mean to say, or when they perhaps in public language should be saying ask, does that offend your ear? It alerts my ear. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm alert to accents and I'm alert you know, my, both of my parents were deeply embarrassed by their accent. Um, Spanish speaking. Spanish speaking. And, uh, you know, my mother was deeply ambitious, fiercely ambitious. She got a job even as a typist when they were hiring her because she was Spanish speaking. Um, as working for Governor Brown, who was the first Governor Brown, who was the governor of California. The current governor's father. That's right. The Pat great, Brown. The, the great the great Pat Brown, you know, the builder of freeways and, and made the water run up the side of a mountain <laughs> into Southern California. Well, she got a job working as a typist, but she didn't know the language. She knew Spanish, and she heard on the tape one day reference to urban guerrillas. And she didn't know the word guerrillas, G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L. -E -E -R 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 right. And she spelled urban guerrilla. G-O-R-I-L-L-A. That's right. And she was fired immediately, OK? Mm. So, I mean, she, she, what she would say if she were here is that it's very tough. It's very tough to, to, to find one's way in a society where everyone is speaking in a certain, with certain understandings, and they're not mine. And I can mimic them until I trip. And that day I tripped. Hmm. I want to raise with you something that has become a bit of a thing in this well, more than a bit of a thing, a lot of a thing in the current U.S. presidential campaign, and you've had to deal with it in your career as well, and that is this notion of political correctness, which you would see a great deal at universities these days. It's dreadful. What's going on? How did this happen? Well, I see it, I'm going to be misunderstood, but I, I really see it as the, you know, I, what's happened in the American Academy right now is that uh, it's become predominantly a woman's school. Um, and not so much in the hard sciences, but in medicine it's becoming more and more, you'll see more women students than male students, but not in engineering. Uh, but nonetheless, as the culture has become feminized in higher education, it has become a concern with things that I never heard from my Irish nuns in Sacramento. Like what? The safe spaces. You know, we, students have to have a safe space, or we can't use that word, you know, because we, we don't want to hurt. Words. Trigger words. Yeah, we can't. Educate, you know, we don't want to raise that subject because it might hurt somebody's feelings. The, the notion, you know, I think of the, the, the women who educated me um, 
when I was in England, there was a woman named Frances Yates who was a great, great uh, historian of, of, of the Middle Ages becoming the Renaissance. That a, that a tough old woman like that would, would be concerned with safe spaces, it's just impossible. Do you look back, though, at your education and think, you know, maybe if they didn't rap me over the knuckles every time I said something wrong, it might have been better? Well, um, can I just say that I, don't, I was at, a, a, at this Lutheran college in, the, in Minnesota the other day, and this teacher came up afterwards. She had wanted to talk to about multiculturalism and her students. Her students, this is the way she described my students, were largely, I think, Mexican-American. And in the morning, of course, I couldn't have, because I always launch into this little teasing attack on Canada. I said, you know, that multiculturalism is a Canadian con invention, and it's, it has seeped across the border into our <laughs> consciousness, and it has now infected us all so that we all drink all of this Canadian water. But it is, there's a little virus in there called multiculturalism. I said that if you really want to be true to your culture, as a Mexican, you b would belong to the, the, the culture of the mestizaje, this mixture of races. So the confusion is so deep that you wouldn't even know how to take the different strains out without a DNA check. But uh, she was so offended by that that she came up, and the very meeting that she'd organized, she canceled. And I was sitting in the, uh, in, the, in the room waiting for the students to come, and she knocked on the door, and she said, I'm not bringing my students in. She, and she started weeping. And I thought, I've never seen this before. The, the college campus is governed by tears. She was afraid of what you might inculcate I guess, in the or kids. that I would hurt their hurt feelings. Their feelings yeah. And uh, by telling them that they're, they're too Canadian, <laughs> would that <laughs> shock them forever? Would they go into a kind of paralysis and, and be unable to eat salmon again? You know, I mean, what? <laughs> but this is a permanent feature of our university campuses, it seems, nowadays. I was, I was at a school in California, and this woman, African American, raised her hand. And she said, you know, you keep referring to the Negro Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s, um, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Malcolm X, um, and you keep using the word Negro. That word is very offensive to me. And I said, why? She said, but that's not my word. She said, I'm black. I said, what do you think the word Negro means in Spanish? That Negro is, is, is black. She said, I don't care, she said. I don't want you using that word. I said, well, what do you want to, what do, you want to do with these documents from the, black, the Negro Civil Rights Movement? You want to go through and edit them out? You want to take every Negro out and put it black because you don't like it? And she wouldn't, she said, she looked away. Mm. Uh, end of discussion. End of discussion. Um, no, I'm, I'm clearly a bad boy. And there are a lot of schools that won't invite me. Partly, it's OK. I'm an old man. I can. I, when you get to my age... You're not that way. You're 72, right? 72. And when you get to be 72, you sort of don't give a damn I, anymore. <laughs> that's, I've got news for you. That's not that old anymore. Well, you're going to tell me that I can still go to your yoga class. Is that what you're going to tell me? I don't know about yoga classes, but, you know, you, you, you may I, have another listen, 25 good years in you. Uh, I, 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 you become an old-timer in California very fast. I suspect it's true in Toronto. You go down that block, and the building that's there today wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> that's true. And it's, everything changes so fast. So I've become a kind of tiresome old man in California because I remember when this, that hillside used to be green, and now it's filled with these cheap... <laughs> Houses. I get you. I get you. But do you do you think that it sounds it? And again, I don't put words in your mouth, but I think what I heard you say is because of the increasing percentage of female students on university campuses, we are a lot more politically correct today than we once were. I think there's a feminization of education. Yes. Well, that's a trend that's going to continue. That yes, right? it's going to. In which case, political correctness on campuses. I think what I think what we're going to have is we're going to have. I, I was an undergraduate at Stanford, which is now this kind of red hot incubator for Silicon Valley, and. Um, Mayor Bloomberg in New York was trying to seduce the president of Stanford, who was easily seducible, uh, to come to New York and build a second campus in the middle of the East River, which was only sciences, hmm. hard sciences. Right. So there they would be like these creatures in a, a Jonathan Swift uh, parody, where the scientists would be in the middle of the river, and at the old Stanford, all these women could be arguing about whether we should use the word black or Negro. Hmm. and and. That failure of the liberal arts right now, I think the, the decline of the liberal arts has come from its softening. Mm. But there is not enough toughness in, in the world. I, 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 I tell the story at, at college campuses because it was true. My uncle for, was from India. Um, my, my Indian uncle married my Mexican aunt because that's what eroticism is, okay? <laughs> and um, he, he was very dark. He was even black, okay? He had European features. And that is a European cut to his features. He didn't look Negro, 
but he, 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 was, he was a very dark complexion. Well, I remember walking down the street with him in Sacramento when I was a boy, and a kid with a red face, acneed face, rowing down his window and yelling nigger at us, yelling nigger at him. And I told that story at school when the word Negro is, a uh, nigger is in, 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 inadmissible. But I couldn't not tell that story that way. If I said a boy rolled down his window with bad acne and said the N word at, I mean, that's the kind of ridiculousness we're moved to, where, where everything, where we even edit the word of the racist so it doesn't get, it, it's too hard for us, you know. So let's not, let's not go there. Let's be, let's be more tender, you know. Let's say N word, okay? It doesn't work for me, but I'm 72. <laughs> I, uh, I want to go back. Your education, you talked about your education in an interview. This, we're going back now 22 years. This is you writing in Reason Online. Here's what you said. We used a lot of skills that came out of a medieval faith. The stress that the nuns placed on memorizing, the notion that education was not so much little junior coming up with a new idea, but little junior having to memorize what was already known. Education was not about learning something new, it was about learning something old. At the same time, they taught us some basic things. We knew certain dates of American history. I knew certain poems by Longfellow. I knew how to multiply. I had a sense of the communal within that tradition. I could not only name popes, but I could also name presidents. I memorized the 48 state capitals. We were in the 13th century, but the 13th century skills prepared us in some remarkable way to belong. What the classroom should insist on is that the student belongs to a culture, a community, a tradition, a memory, and the fact, and the fact that he's related to all kinds of people that he'll never know. That's the point of education. Okay, let's, I want to pick up on a bunch of things. That's First pretty of good. All, yeah, yeah, that's he's, pretty good. He's pretty smart. He's that pretty guy. smart, that guy. But how come he's so smart? But he's only got forty-eight states here. What's, <laughs> what, what's going on there? <laughs> he forgot that when I was a kid, Hawaii and Alaska were not states. They yet. were not there yet. But so, it was true that for religion class. Uh, I was a Catholic, a, a deep medieval Catholic, and I knew Latin, and I was an altar boy at many, many funerals and many, many weddings, and I know still, a deum quilitificat juventus te meum, I will go to the altar of God, the God who gives joy to my youth. I went to funerals and, and watched the widow weep as the, as, her, as the casket went into the ground, and then I went back to the arithmetic class at school. I lived in these two different worlds. I lived in the America that was promising me the, the I, that I, would become, I could become an I person. The great glamour of America was this, I am. I can, I can be anything I want just because my father made false teeth. Doesn't mean I had to make false teeth. I be, exist. Um, and in the classroom with those nuns who were themselves creatures of the we, who were communal, who were in order, who were sisters of mercy. Um, they belonged to a society, a community. And so the, the, already the dialectic in my life, which has never been ex successfully um, appraised, was between a, a, a religious tradition that prized the community and, an, and an, a, a, a political tradition which prized my individuality. Hmm. Now, the, the irony of that, of course, is that there is a we in America, the, the we of the I, that it passes down from generation to generation. But it is so radical, this I, that we always think that we discovered it. There are kids who think they've discovered sex. You know, the Gramps had nothing to do with it, you know. <laughs> um, because we really do have a system that we've sort of stumbled upon everything. We've stumbled upon evil. We've, we've lost our, in, uh, that, that, that phrase in America, I've, you know, America lost its innocence. Mm -hmm. We've been losing our innocence, so it's like a whorehouse, you know. She loses her innocence every Tuesday night, you know. Um, this culture is, has never prepared us for a sense of the communal paradox of the I. Right now, Americans are very lonely people, and partly because the only community we have is the fake community of cafeteria, where these groups will sit together. There will be a table over there for Latinos, over there for Chinese, over there for nerds, over there for girls who have green and blue hair. We don't know who exactly they are. Over there for uh, Goths, um, and they all sort of live within these little wee communities. Over here for, for jocks, the, the, at the risk of, of serious head trauma, boys continue playing football in America mm -hmm. because it's one of the few places where they can find a we in the middle of, uh, of, of a culture that they are told when they go back to the classroom, exhausted, too exhausted to read their school books, that they better get at it because this whole educational system is based on the I, 
the I becoming an engineer, the I becoming a lawyer, the I becoming a dentist. But their, their energies have been so depleted by the afternoon practice of becoming we that they don't know how to balance the two. And, and for my own anxiety as a Catholic in those years, I remain a Catholic, but um, I've never completely adequately divided those, those, those identities. I noticed that, that Governor Pence, who was, uh, who's been running as, as the vice presidential uh, nominee with, uh, with Donald Trump, does, does distinguish, he's an evangelical Christian, between being an American and being a Christian. And I make that distinction too, mm. I must say, that on a, um, an issue like illegal immigration, for example, as an American, I think that, that we have to be much more careful about who comes into the country. As a, as a Christian, I think the imperative to, tr to treat the stranger well is clear. Um, and I treat, it's like having two seasons in my life. I am both uh, January and I'm also April. And I have to mediate between those two identities all the time. Hmm. Fascinating. How much of what you described in there do you think is the foundation of American education today? I don't think we, I don't think we adequately give us students a sense of their community. I was, uh, I, you know, that our implication, I, in my neighborhood now in San Francisco, very upscale neighborhood of very young entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who have lots of money and these cars that go 500 miles an hour uh, but can't be driven at that speed because there's a, a stoplight at every intersection. Um, there will be on a, on, a, on a day like Martin Luther King's birthday, there will be Mexicans hammering, uh, painting. And I will always ask these guys, why aren't, you t why aren't you taking the day off today? It's a holiday. And, and they will have heard of it, but it has nothing to do with them. Hmm. You understand? Well, it does have something to do with them. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. is part of my, my formation. Just as Thomas Jefferson, the slave owner, who is also the, one of the framers of the Declaration of Independence, has something to do with me. And that, that we don't teach children to successfully understand the ambiguity of the American identity. Let me follow up on that as it relates to you. Given that you spoke only Spanish the first five, six years of your life, and then only English after that, how much of your Mexican heritage do you think you have turned your back on at this stage of your life? Oh, probably a large part of it. I, 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 don't, I don't have, I mean, if you talk, I've talked, I worked with the BBC along the border and I've talked to Mexican kids coming across and almost all of them speak in the language of nosotros, of the we. Why are you coming? Well, my mother has a, is sick and she needs the money. Why are you coming? Because my kids don't have any, any food. Why are you coming? Because, I, because my uncle needs somebody to work with him in Reno, Nevada. It's always this language of the we. And they're coming into a culture that is rig rigorously a culture of I, I. And we'll use them as that until it doesn't want them anymore. And then we'll turn them back in, into, into peaches of the we. Se habla espanol? Más o menos. How's your Spanish today compared to the way it was better once upon than, a time? Better than yours. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I don't speak any, so there you go. <laughs> I'm safe. <laughs> no, well, I can do, there, right? you know, I can yeah. do, I, I have, there are Mexican workers in my building all the time, um, and they, they're so brilliant at, at, at fixing and the way my father was. Uh, and I can manage the Espanol de la Cocina, you know, this, this kind of home Spanish. Uh, but I was, you know, I've been, I've given lectures in Spain and Mexico, academic lectures, and it's difficult. I have to have it really rehearsed. Mm -hmm. I was, I was um, having dinner one night in Mexico City with these very wealthy Mexicans. And um, I was talking to one of the men who owns the, the huge television enterprise called Televisa. And he was telling me, the French, they're, they're, the, the Mexican upper class are obsessed with France. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about the hotels in, the, in, in Nice, he stays at the Negresco all the time with his wife. They were married there. And he was going on and on the way they all do. And the wives all had orange hair. And, um, like Trump. And he said in the middle of, the, of this long discussion, he said, and who are you, he said. And I said, well, I'm a writer. I've come to the, from, Mex from the United States to give a talk in Mexico. Oh, un escritor, he said. And then he said something to me that no one in the United States has ever said. He said, you know, in Mexico, we don't have writers who look like you. He meant that in Mexico, look at it. 
Look at Mexico. Look at Mexico television. Look at the soap operas, the, the telenovelas. The people who are the heroes in Mexico, the great writers in Mexico, are look, they look European. The, the mm. government people, are all, they all look European. The beauty queens all look European. They don't look Indian the you're way too, I look. You're too dark-skinned to be a yes, Mexican hero? Yes, and these, fe these features huh. are pre-Columbian, and, hmm. and the fingers are pre-Columbian, and, and my little feet are pre-Columbian. They're running up and down the, 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 uh, the pyramid. That's what he meant. Hmm. And I don't. Go, I, I may go to the Negresco, but I might. I should impersonate the the Arab when I'm at the Negresco. <laughs> Apparently, there's a Mexican saying which says, "Poor Mexico, so close to the United States and so far from God." What does that mean? It means it was said by a very corrupt politician who <laughs> sold a lot of the interests of Mexico to the United States. But nonetheless, Mexico has a self pitying, a self pitying mode. Uh, Mexico has been complicit in her in her debauchery, hmm. all along the border for for generations. Mexico is a very cynical culture. And Mexico was bordered to this very hypocritical culture of the United States. And so whatever was illegal in the United States, say gambling, say whorehouses, mm. say abortion, say drugs, say boxing, whatever was illegal in the United States, Mexico offered it in Tijuana. You come, come over on, the, on Saturdays. I was doing a documentary once in, for the BBC on, in, in, Mexico, in Tijuana, Mexico, on a Saturday night. I was asking all these American teenage kids, why do they come to Mexico? You can do anything in San Diego now. You can have your abortion. You can change your sex. You can do anything. Why do you come? She said, the girl said on television, she said, it's cool to get drunk in Mexico, she said. That's a thing. <laughs> Pres yeah, presumably it's cool to barf in Mexico, you know. <laughs> but, the, the, but in the morning, both sides separate. Mexico pockets the dollars in her blouse, mm -hmm. and the American pretends that he was never there, <laughs> even though he has the genital disease to prove that he was there. This, 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 this correspondence between a culture that is deeply cynical and a culture that is deeply hypocritical has gone on for many generations. Uh, you know, I love Lucy, the TV show. Ricky. Ricky the Ricardo. The Hispanic. Yes. And Lucy, the American. CBS didn't want Ricky Ricardo. They wanted somebody else. But Lucy insisted she wanted a real husband, even though he had an accent, even though he looked, he would walk around the living room of their house in his, in his smoking jacket. No American <laughs> husband ever did that, uh, even though he would, Lucy would drive him. She was the loca, and she was the crazy one, and he would always have to, I, uh, you know, the, and then they give birth to the first Hispanic. You know, we all waited for little Ricky to be born, and there was that, that drama. It did, uh, you know, Americans, when they didn't know Latin America very well, uh, when it seemed farther away t from them than, than now r r in your face, mm -hmm. romanticized Latin America. There were movie stars in, from, from Mexico, band Latin leaders. America, band leaders. Yeah. Uh, but when it got close, then we turned into criminals. Um, but, but Americans were in love with the Latin lover for a long time. And mm -hmm. even the, the Latin lover, um, who was an Arab, um, Rudolf Valentino, uh, who in fact uh, per portrayed the, the Arab was uh, French and Spanish. The sheik um, was French and Spanish. Fr French and Italian. French and Italian. French yeah. and, Italian. Um, huh. and and we 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 named our theaters in America uh, the Alhambra. Mm. This this evocation of this romance with the Arab uh, uh, frontier in Spain. Um, no one would do that today. I mean, the, the notion of the, the Hispanic as being a romantic figure may in actuality be the case. I, on, 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 in everyday conversation, you meet people now, you know, oh, hi, I'm Cindy, Cindy um, Gonzalez, she will say, with this blonde hair. And the, 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 inter, the intermarriage now is so, is so complicated. Mm -hmm. In my own family, I, you know, my, my sister, who's very dark skinned, married a German American. And her grandchildren look like these little Swedes. These little <laughs> kids from Stockholm are running around at Thanksgiving. It, the, I don't think we know what America is going to look like in another two or three generations. Well, let me try this on for size, because eight years ago in Newsweek, you wrote the following. For centuries, Latin America has acknowledged brown. The majority population of Mexico has been, since the 18th century, mestizo or mixed. In Brazilian Portuguese, there is a long list of words to describe brown. In America, we've had only two white and black. That's right. Given the history of America, the history of appalling slavery, is it understandable that they have such a monochromatic way of looking at things? Well, is it understandable that we don't even want to acknowledge that Thomas Jefferson gave birth to brown children? 
uh, that, that his... Well, that Sally did. He didn't. Sally Hemmings. Sally that, Hemmings. That's right. Yeah. That Sally Hemmings upstairs or downstairs was having these children that didn't look exactly white or black. Mm -hmm. um, is it right, right to acknowledge the fact that, that, um, that there are other races in America, that there are Chinese, for example, in San Francisco, that there are um, uh, Arabs in China, San Francisco, that there are uh, people who don't see themselves in the white and black uh, dialectic. That problem in America, which was exacerbated by, the, by Jim Crow laws, where if you had one drop of black, one drop of African, yeah. you were black. If your hair, your hair could have been okay, but if we detected that there was black in you, no matter how, how minimal that, that, that measure, you were black. Well, the African Americans have turned that against white America now with a president who himself is mulatto mm -hmm. in Spanish, but in America he becomes our first black president mm -hmm. because that's the only way we know how to read it. We don't know how to read anything more complex. Our history is not complex, you understand. Mm -hmm. I did not know that slaves sometimes married their slave owners. I did not know that from anything I read in the classroom. I read that many years later, because America's history is much more complicated than anything we gave ourselves credit for. Have you seen Birth of a Nation yet? Did you that see? happen? It, it, it certainly tells a different story about slavery, a new story about slavery that uh, will be a revelation to many people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Around the year 2045, whites are going to be the minority in the United States. It's not. You can't use those terms. Okay, what's, what's, the, the, how should I be putting it? Because whites don't exist. Whites are a fantasy. Okay. When the Irish start coming in, they're the first major immigrant group in the 19th century. They want to be white too, but Anglo-Saxon America doesn't want Irish. They are, they're, 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 they're considered lower than black. And the struggle of, of, of the Irish to become white. Noel Ignatieff has written, one, written a wonderful book about how the Irish became white in America. You know how they became white in America? By convincing America that they were not black. Hmm. By, in some sense, denigrating black Americans and pushing against them. And it's a, a number of other immigrant groups did the same thing. We are not black. No somos negros, hmm. okay? That, that we, are, we are a different kind of people. Well, that, that, that journey to become white in America is a real journey to seek my freedom in America with whiteness. It doesn't still exist, though, right? It, it, it very much exists. I mean, in the New York Times, every week, it seems there's this, there's this poll about race relations in black and white America. No, I know, but the, the, the millennials, the younger generation, the young people coming up, they don't care about this. I give, I give lectures on being brown, by which I mean mixed, and kids will come up to me after the words, and the girl will say, this is a preface to her question. She says, I'm white. I'm nothing. White is nothing. Yes. She's, or, or he'll mm. say, I'm white, I have no culture. Mm. That the price of being white in America is that you obliterate memory, that mm. you no longer have a Swedish grandmother, that your mother no longer is, has died of cancer, mm. that you have no history, that your father is not out of work, that all the things that might colorize your life, grief, joy, uh, a tradition of, 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 of hard labor, everything that might colorize your memory is, is, is a is obliterated in this bleach of whiteness. And we say to the Appalachian white, well, you're not a minority because, well, you're white. Mm. And, and, and they, there's this term in, in, in the South, this particularly vicious term of the middle class against poor whites, which described them as trash, uh, white trash. White trash, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's pretty strong. Mm. That's pretty strong. Yeah. And that book that everybody's supposed to read in grammar school, which I hated, this book, um, to kill a mockingbird in which the, the lawyer in this southern town, you know, the genteel lawyer, is already the protector of the black against the, the, the vicious racist who is this lower class white, okay? This, this scenario that racism in the South had nothing to do with the genteel so the country club people, it all was a creation of a lower class. It's, 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 com it's complete fantasy. But we have mistreated the white population in America to the extent that we have obliterated their past. Hmm. In that sense, Canadian multiculturalism, which teaches kids to understand their history as something more than simply race, but to understand culture as varied and complicated, to give a Mormon kid that, to give a, to give a son of divorced parents that, that you have had a life, that there is something in you, that you're not simply white, is an important thing. Hmm. In our remaining moments here, let me put the focus back on you for a bit, because you are, you're an openly gay man who lives in San Francisco, California. I'm not a gay man. I'm a morose man. You know, 
look at my question here, number 15. I was going to say, some years ago, you called yourself, quote, a morose homosexual. Well, Charlie Rose said, do you think of yourself as a, as a gay writer? I said, no, I'm a, I think of myself as a morose writer. Morose? Why morose? Well, you I... You seem like a perfectly happy person. I, when I was closer in age to you, maybe probably younger, uh, I went through the AIDS crisis, and I helped... Oh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but I helped about 40 men die. And I knew how to do that. I knew how to change diapers and bedpans. And, and I knew when you were going to die tonight, enough to call your mother, if your mother even cared. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I shoveled the morphine down your throat. Nobody told us how to do that. You learned how to do that. The doctor said, well, you need this. And put it in the refrigerator until it really comes necessary. I think something died in, my, in me from those years, that there is still, see, <laughs> it comes welling up, um, a sadness so deep. Um, I did a piece in the New York Times recently called Nakedness in a Digital Age, in which I talked about being in a car with five gay men in the 1970s. We were driving down the peninsula of San Francisco to a prep school. We were going to be judges of an essay contest. And that, we were like clowns in a circus in this little car, all like this in the back seat. And I remember somebody was putting his hand across to reach um, for something, I forgot what. And I remember the touch of his sleeve, which was cashmere. Well, with the, the windows were steamed up, so much life in that car. Within five years, everybody in that car was dead. Except you. Except me. And you rather feel like, you know, a soldier who's come back from war, and everybody, the street is crowded, the restaurants are noisy, um, you know, nobody reads newspapers anymore in the world, but they sure go to restaurants and they scream at each other. Um, and, but something died in me, do you understand? And um, in some real sense, I'm not gay. I'm queer in the sense that I had a wonderful childhood. I was so free because I wasn't heterosexual. I could do anything. I, I knew I wasn't going to go to the junior prom, and I knew that Malcolm X was coming to Sacramento, so I went to go see Malcolm X. I had that freedom. Um, I went to boxing matches alone. I went to the opera when it came to Sacramento from San Francisco. I, I, I remember when there was one night in Sacramento at the Memorial Water Tournament, there was a, 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 leather, a, a featherweight boxer by the name of Bobby Chacon. He's been on my mind because he died recently. Mm -hmm. He's a very slight Mexican guy, tough, tough guy. And his wife had committed suicide in despair because he wouldn't give up the ring. The next night he went to fight. And that's when I saw him fight. And he was, the, the auditorium was filled with these Mexican laborers from the fields, the braceros, men who work with their arms, the braceros. Um, and everybody was standing for the 12 rounds. Man, it was, they were, they were fighting in, in they, were, they were engaged in a kind of struggle that was so elemental and primal and at the end, he was the victor. You should have seen his face. And I thought to myself, as I walked home that night, and there would be no one at school I would describe this to, or even my erotic interest in this boxer. No one. They had been to the junior prom, or they'd been to a dance, or they were talking about a basketball game. I had seen a primal boxing match that night. So it never seemed like an oppression to me. It seemed like a freedom. To, to go to a Broadway musical, even though it was a third run, Broadway musical at an auditorium. Uh, there was never any risk that I would see a classmate because they didn't go to those things. That I, I went to come see the King and I, you know, and, <laughs> and there was all that miscegenation at the, um, up, on, the, on the stage. It was wonderful. L illicit love, that was my great theme. And when I started seeing, you know, my, my uncle's um, wife, uh, my uncle's uh, um, nephew, one Christmas brought home a woman, a blonde woman. He was Indian, she was blonde. And I was riveted by that, the blonde woman and the Indian. Because wherever love was unexpected or illicit or strange, as I was strange, I was galvanized by that. I was just enchanted. So I remember going home after Christmas and asking my mother, ah, I was breathing against the window and making these little, uh, these little diagrams on the window, asking her, her who the blonde lady was. And she was tired from too much Christmas, too much this, too much that. What are you asking? Everybody else was semi-asleep in the back of the car. Why is she here? Why does she come to our Christmas? And my mother gave me some easy answer, like she met him, Ramesh was his name. 
Kamini was his name. She met Kamini at school and they became a couple. That's why she was there. Love had brought her there. I realized one day when I had, you were my best friend in, in grammar school and I was in love with you. You had a beautiful face. And one day I threw a rock at that face to make you go away. And that night, our mothers talked on the phone. And there was this laughter. And I knew that the mothers had decided that boys will be boys. Boys will fight with boys. Mm. And it was OK. But if they had only known that the reason I threw the rock at Bobby was because I was in love with him, bang, would the ceiling come down. Different story. So that, I mean, I knew that there was that prohibition. But I also knew that this thing that love was about had nothing to do with religion. It had everything to do with the blonde lady and my, hmm. my uncle's nephew. To hear you, you'll forgive this superficial analysis, to hear you talk this way, so engaged, so enlivened about these issues, uh, to me, in spite of what you went through 25 years ago and the AIDS crisis, you're, you're not morose. You are engaged, you are involved, you are still so alive. There doesn't look to be anything morose about you now. No, but I, I mean, one takes certain consolations. I mean, there's, there's a, impersonations that you, that you make. Um, I'm more cheerful in public than I am, probably. Hmm. I'm very depressed at the state of writing in the world right now. I have maybe a book that I published. The essays are getting more difficult and more complicated. I, I did a, a thing at an Anglican church the other day, and the audience was quite riveted by what I was talking about. There was a little lady in the back selling books. An Anglican church, I mean, as sweet as, as you can imagine. And I was watching over your shoulder, and the kids came up afterwards to talk to me. Nothing was being sold. Nothing was being bought. You know, I used to own a bookstore in San Francisco that went bust, and didn't go bust because, because of Amazon or, or because, you know, the superstores came in. It became, it went bust because a, a certain old lady stopped coming. She died. And we had been at Carriage Trade Bookstore downtown, Tillman Place Books. And um, we had all these society women who did not go to college that generation. They had gone to Paris or they'd gone and they became, they were, they, in various ways, they finished their education. And they came into the store and they would read anything we told them to read. Books on Japanese horticulture, British mystery novels, anything because that was the, the, the sort of the substance of their dinner party conversations and then she died and we might see her daughter maybe once or twice the granddaughter never again hmm. that the loss of that that literary tradition in my life has really weighed on me and i'm very sad about it that so much is lost and that um the pleasure that i get from reading and writing I can't share anymore. Uh, I, I don't want to. Was going to say I don't want to leave this on such a sour note. Why not? But, 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 but no, no. We, but are we leave our lives on a sour note. Yeah, but uh, you know, we Canadians are optimists. But I still want to ask you about something that's still somehow uh, troubling as well, beyond what you've already shared with us. What happened to your religious sensibilities after 9/11? I needed to meet the Arab. I needed to meet my, the stranger. I didn't know about Islam. I knew nothing about Muslims, except uh, you know, uh, the, par the, 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 the stereotypes in, in, in old m movies. And uh, I've always approached the thing that I was most afraid of. And so um, I arranged to, to go meet the stranger. Who? Uh, I went first to Israel, then Egypt, then Saudi Arabia. And I remember once in Cairo, this is a true story, I tell it in my my last book, which no one will read, so don't even bother. Say the title? No, I'm not going to say the title. Say the it, it title. No one will read it. Somebody might go to a bookstore and pick it up. The Somebody might chapter, go to a library. Uh, this book called Darling. The first chapter is called Ohala. Because in, in Cairo, I said to my Egyptian a friend, there's a lot of Spanish and Arabic, isn't there? And he says, no, there's a lot of uh, Arabic and Spanish. Spanish. He says, there are something like three to 4,000 Arabic words in Spanish. And then I remembered my mother in Sacramento, California, bidding me goodbye as I went off to school. Ojalá, she said. Ojalá it's not going to rain today. And that the, the jacket you're wearing is going to be, let's hope that. It comes, it's a variant of the Inshallah. In, inshallah. Uh, and there, but I did not hear Ojalá as, as, I did not hear that she was announcing the, the name of God. It was Ojalá. 
It was my mother speaking. And what I realized that day, rather like those advertisements of her DNA retrieval, is that I had gone to see the stranger and that I was possibly that stranger and that the Arab was, was in me. And that um, uh, through Spain, I belong to the Middle East. Um, now, it's, I'm very careful in the Middle East as a gay man. Even in a city like Jerusalem, even at a five-star hotel, even when it's being paid for by the National Geographic magazine. And when we checked in uh, to the, the American Colony Hotel, I was, t uh, I, I specified, because National Geographic is very um, generous to its writers, that I wanted one of the suites. Uh, uh, this is a castle owned by an Ottoman prince who kept various of his wives alongside. Uh, so wife number one was there, wife number two was there, and so forth. Well, the, the, the the manager saw the two of us arriving, and there was a problem. He, I said, what the, what's the problem? He said, there's only one bed in the suite. I said, that's not a problem. I said, Jim has cold feet, but he stays up front. Jim is your partner. Well, yes, and it was a problem. He said, why don't you go to have, have breakfast on the patio? He said, we'll see what we can do. So we were having breakfast on the patio, and I saw all these, these Palestinians struggling with this, with this mattress coming up and down the stairs. And they had set up a day bed. And I realized that it was not for me, not for us, it was for them. You understand? Yeah. And so we went into the bedroom, and there was this old Palestinian man making, nice, making things nice. And I thanked him. And he turned around and he winked at me. And I realized it's a much more complicated world than any Baroque line that, that I can Isn't imagine. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That, Ohala. that wink spoke volumes to yeah. them. Yeah. And are you okay being the other? That realization that you're the other as well? You okay with that? Um, I'm okay with it. It makes it. It makes me wonder about, uh, um, you know, when people are afraid of, of the migrants coming across from the south into the United States. I don't think they realize how much of the other those migrants are. I think they're bringing religion back into America, and without it, we would be in the United States uh, seeing the decline. Of the of spirituality in, in America, by which I mean the churches, um, the evangelicals, the Mormons, who are now in the rural population, Spanish speaking, uh, the Catholics, who are in decline numerically, were it not for immigrants from Latin America, we are bringing back religion, at the same time being described as, as the other, but we are in in fact reintroducing America to its own themes. We are singing the Protestant hymns that that America has lost. When I go to Europe now, I see uh, a country, uh, countries that are depleted religiously. The churches of Europe are empty. Um, and they've been turned into tourist attractions where everybody's standing in Notre Dame with their selfies, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think Europe will become a Muslim continent within probably two or three generations because there's only an emptiness there. There's no spiritual core to owning a Volvo. Uh, <laughs> whereas in America, there is still the possibility with this, this animation that is coming with immigrants for the soul to be recovered. But it's not clear to me that, that, that we will have it. The, this, this rush that's coming out of the Middle East, which is where these religions originated, the desert god, the Abrahamic god, coming out of the desert, coming in now into Europe, coming into the United States and Canada, bringing faith is terrifying to us because we no longer speak that language, but it is here. Well. If you won't be your own publicist, I will. If you like this conversation and you want to hear more from this fella, his latest is called Darling, a <laughs> spiritual autobiography. And I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed having you in this studio. It's so great to meet you, and thank you for so much of your time. You're terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.